working, working. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to a discussion that will try to answer one of the big questions that is facing really too many journalists in too many countries at the moment. I'm Jackie Park. I'm the Head of Network Strategy and Innovation for the International Press Institute, which is the global network of journalists, editors and publishers. So we've got an hour for the discussion today. And because of the COVID restrictions, there aren't mics for questions, but we'll still try to leave some time at the end and somehow manage. Um, you could either email me a question, and my email is pretty simple. It's jpark at ipi.media. That's jpark at ipi.media. So if you have a burning question, you can shoot it through, through the session and we'll get to it. Um, otherwise, we can just, you know, try and improvise, see what happens. Okay, so it's hard enough to create and build a modern multimedia uh, news outlet these days. And each of our panellists here has had to do it harder still, under pressure from governments, usually their own, but sometimes others, and also from political and social agents. So you need to keep the lights on and the newsroom humming. How do you do it? To my mind, the three people from the IPI Global Network that we have here today and the organisations that they have founded have each found practical ways to hack this challenge. Each in their own country, they've built an, an important new media voice that forces a reshape of the media ecosystem. They've demonstrated what journalism can be and what it needs to be when we're under pressure. So we have to my left, Veronica Monk, uh, who's the founding editor-in-chief of Hungary's Telex. And to my right, we have uh, Darina Shevchenko, who is the CEO of the Kyiv Independent. And then we have Siddharth Varadarajan, who's the founder editor of India's The Wire. So please welcome Veronica, Darina and Siddharth. And before we start the conversation, I really want to say how proud we are, you know, the world journalism community and the IPI Global Network in particular is how proud we really are to stand in solidarity with the journalists of Ukraine right now. And just, you know, what an incredible inspiration it is, I think, to all of us. So let's start the conversation at the beginning, which, as we know, is a very good place to start. So I'll start, Veronica, with Telex. So Telex started out as a kind of like a journalist revolt against state capture of Hungarian media. So I just, I guess, tell us the story. How did you, what, what was the, the need and how did you fill it? How did you go about creating Telex? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to explain a little bit what Telex is. This is one of the largest Hungarian general interest news dailies, uh, which uh, was founded by the same group of journalists who left together uh, from our previous workplace called Index, which was the most influential, largest uh, uh, newspaper, online news uh, portal in my country. I have been worked there for 18 years, started as an intern, ended up as one of the deputy editor-in-chiefs at the site, uh, 
and one and a half year ago, basically uh, after 10 years of obvious uh, political pressure, our editor-in-chief was fired, so on a single day the whole newsroom decided to quit. That's happened in July 2020, and uh, on the same day there was a large protest on the streets of Budapest, like thousands of people was marching on the street and protesting beside freedom of press. But uh, I always like to refuse uh, when uh, we are presented as some kind of freedom fighters or, or uh, fighters against the political system because uh, the strongest value of uh, the group of my journalistic uh, community at Telex. Uh, the main value is impartiality, so we strongly believe that every democracy needs uh, fact-based quality journalism and just we would like, we just wanted to stick together and continue our work. So what we did, we turned to our readers as I mentioned, our previous workplace was a 20 years old, very well known, very influent newspaper. So what we basically did, we went on YouTube. I personally was standing on the street and said, but it was a more sophisticated way, but the message was that guys, you know us because we did great journalism for you in the last two decades, please give us money. And they did. They did, uh, in the first month, we collected one million euros. So we could start, uh, we could start the business uh, slowly based on crowdfunding. Now, uh, after one and a half year, years, uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, the, the, the largest crowdfunding based online news daily in the country. We have like six to 700,000 readers a day and our revenue is coming partly, major, the majority of our, our revenue is coming from the readers. It's not a subscription-based model, but a donation-based um, uh, model, and, and the smaller part is coming from traditional advertisement and from grants. So yeah, basically the solution what we had is to turn to the readers and offer them fact-based quality journalism and say to them that guys, you need to contribute financially if you would like to consume the news you had before. Okay. Um, uh, Jarena, the Kiev Independent is the youngest media outlet of this group. And, but, you, but you have a similar background where the journalists refuse to accept unacceptable editorial interventions, right? And so, so just tell us a bit about how did you turn that journalistic threat into the opportunity to create a new independent voice? Yeah, um, thank you, Jackie, and thank you for the support. Um, Kiev Independent is four months old. Oh, I guess it's five months old now. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, we have pretty much the same story. So... Um, we all at some, you know, I worked at the Kiev Post at some point, but then I left. Uh, I joined the group of journalists later. But so generally, we worked at the Kiev Post, Ukraine's oldest English language newspaper. Uh, it existed on the market for 26 years. Uh, it changed a couple of owners, but most of them, you know, uh, adhered to the journalism standards and wouldn't interfere in the editorial independence. Uh, the last one, though, uh, had a, you know, kind of different mindset. He is, um, he was a construction tycoon in Ukraine and uh, at some point uh, he decided he, he tried to interfere, uh, interfere in the editorial independence, then journalists stood up to him and then at some point he um, came to the newsroom and basically fired the whole team. Um, and uh, on that same day, journalists knew that we wouldn't just let it go so they tried to negotiate with him on like selling the Kiev Post to somebody like to um, donors or who were willing to cover the costs, uh, but he refused. He refused to sell the trademark. So uh, after that, uh, we thought that we should do something. I, as a Kiev Post alumni, uh, at the time I wasn't working in the team, but I uh, contacted the team because I knew all of them. Um, 
we suggested that we help, I help with the managerial side. Um, so the editorial team and the managers from Genomics Media Consulting, that's where I worked at the moment, we uh, started, decided to co-create the uh, Kiev Independent. Um, we made a decision on like November something, like 13 or something, and we knew that we have basically a month to set everything up because on December 20, the work, and we are English language, so the work usually ends for the <laughs> Western world. Um, and we had just a month to basically build a, a company that would be um, competitive on the market. Um, our market didn't make it easy for us, so as soon as we announced that we are you know, creating a company, uh, our colleagues started setting up English language publications <laughs> and uh, English language versions of their publications. Um, and as soon as we announced that we are creating a new publication, Kyiv Post relaunched its operations. Um, we call it the Frankenstein Kyiv Post because what they did was uh, not good. But, um, and it was frankly painful to watch because that was the brand we loved and invested a lot into. But, you know, we had to do our thing and we did. Um, so in the beginning we, uh, we knew we had to be sustainable. We knew that we can't rely on, on one owner or even you know, on donor funding fully because that's uh, not gonna help us in the long run. So we uh, decided to diversify the revenue streams as much as possible. We, I talked to many uh, people from different countries who suggested uh, that I pick a revenue stream and then just go for it. And then I said, no, <laughs> uh, I'll do different things and then I, at the end, this is what saved us when the war started because, uh, as you can imagine, you know, if I went for the commercial um, revenues only, they ended overnight in Ukraine. Uh, there is no advertising market non-existent. Um, but I also had um, membership set up on Patreon. Why Patreon? Because we had to create it overnight, so it was the easiest solution for us. And when we set up Patreon, we didn't even have a website, so. Uh, that was it. Um, I already had a set up crowdfunding campaign on GoFundMe, uh, so that you know went up quickly. Um, I, t I had uh, I already you know we had a registered uh, legal entity abroad too, uh, in addition to one in Ukraine. Um, yeah, and then uh, we also had donor funding, uh, so that also helped. Um, that's that's basically it. That's that's how we were set up, and that's you know uh, the story. How many journalists came across? What was the uh, so everybody number? came across the whole team of the Kiev Post. It was thirty something journalists and editors and photographers and whatever designers, uh, the whole editorial staff. The problem was that we as a startup couldn't really afford thirty journalists, so. Uh, and not everybody could stay because when we got the funding, we offered obviously like uh, salaries that were cut a lot, essentially. Um, so some people just left to do other things. At some, so all the people stayed with us until we got the funding and, and were you know understood how much money we have for how many people, um, and everybody helped set up this. Uh, but then some people uh, left, some people we had to say goodbye to because we just didn't have the resources. Like, I mean, for example, Kiev Post had five photographers. Right. <laughs> we couldn't even nearly afford for five photographers, so uh, we stayed with just one photographer. But all the pho pho photographers were like all, all fine. One of the photo editors actually became, became a manager. Um, in the commercial department, <laughs> uh, you know, so we were very flexible and the team was very flexible. Everybody wanted to do that, so that helped. Yeah, okay. Uh, sit out and um, so if the, if the Kiev Independent is the baby of the group, then The Wire is really like the veteran journalist, right? You've worked for, you know, as editor of for some of the biggest media in, in India. And I think you talk about you and your co-founders have 100 years experience, <laughs> 100 years of journalism. I've heard you say that, I think. <laughs> um, so so what, what were the shortcomings of the Indian media ecosystem and particularly, you know, what you saw in 
what is India that inspired you, you know, that you felt like the wire was really yeah. what was needed? And how did you do it? Okay. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so the, the wire actually um, began to take shape in, in the mind of its founders uh, before Modi became prime minister, so end of 2013, early 2014. But it took us a year to get the concept off the ground, by, by which time Modi had been elected and uh, many of our worst fears about the kind of uh, media landscape uh, you know, were proven, proven correct. Uh, you know, Modi came to power in May, May 2014, and uh, with the backing of a significant section of the national media, who either for uh, ideological or political reasons decided to back him or felt that it was a good business proposition. And there was also a section, I suppose, of media, and this has become clear over the last seven years, that for a variety of reasons is vulnerable to um, pressure and threat, threats of one kind or the other, and are thus unwilling to rock the boat. Uh, so even if they, their promoters lack any great political commitment to Modi's project, um, and even if they don't directly derive great business benefits from Modi being in power, but they are unwilling to take risks for fear of what might happen uh, to, to their business activities uh, by a vindictive you know, regime. Uh, that's, broadly speaking, the, the media terrain that, uh, you know, that existed, that we saw at the time when we were thinking of the war, largely because uh, the Indian media business model is uh, almost entirely driven by, by private investors, by, by, by companies. In some cases, families, family-owned companies, but increasingly uh, there is um, you know, growing corporate interest. And uh, we identified the investor in this uh, uh, business model of the Indian media as being the weak link as far as uh, editorial integrity and editorial independence is concerned. Uh, because they become the obvious conduits for pressure. And even if there isn't pressure, we know from Indian and global experience that uh, private owners, uh, businessmen who are out to make money, are not always um, committed to um, you know, editorial integrity. And uh, in some ways, this is reflected by what you heard about you know, stories from Hungary, Ukraine, other places. And so for us, the three founders uh, who between us have 100 years of uh, journalistic experience, um, we figured that if we want to start something new, it should be digital because entry barriers and cost, uh, you know, the costs uh, are low. And uh, secondly, that it should be based on a business model that would not have those very obvious vulnerabilities. Uh, and the only answer was to look to readers as, uh, as a pillar of financial support. And in the interim, until you scale up, to try to gather and try to look for some kind of philanthropic um, backing. Now, under the Indian legal, uh, legal landscape, uh, we, we set ourselves up as a, as a non-profit company, so we are pretty much the only uh, mainstream non-profit <coughs> news organization in India. And being non-profit meant that uh, we got certain tax benefits, <coughs> but it also meant that uh, it was not legally possible to access donations from abroad. So if you're a non-profit in the media space, you can only receive donations from Indian nationals. Um, and and uh, it's illegal to get donations from foreigners. And, and, and this was a constraint that we knew uh, we would uh, be operating under, but we thought there was enough uh, heft, enough uh, weight in the Indian philanthropic system to, to, to get us off the ground. And uh, in the initial years that we launched in 2015, uh, from 2015 till 2018 or 2019, we were able to secure 
a, a decent measure of philanthropic support from, uh, from a foundation that was set up by one of India's uh, tech business, business people who, who mo mobilized other uh, companies to donate money into a general fund that would be administered by a board of uh, individuals who were really you know, renowned for their independent uh, mindedness. And we applied for a grant and got support for three or four years, and that, that helped us to get off the ground. That, that grant is no longer, that support is no longer available for us. Uh, and today we um, are, you know, we raise 70 to 80 uh, percent, I would say 60 to 70 percent of our donation, of our operating budget comes from uh, small donations from readers. So we have an on site donation button. And we encourage readers, not in a very aggressive way. So it's not those of you who read The Guardian know you get a pop-up each time. We don't give pop-ups. But we, we managed to, to raise 60 to 70 percent of our revenue from uh, some small donations. We get uh, another 10 to 15 percent uh, from medium-sized donations. So we, you know, lawyer or somebody who's quite well off, uh, we will try to get 5000 or $10,000 equivalent in rupees from them. Uh, and, and then the balance, 15 to 20 percent, comes from uh, advertising income or um, some con business contracts that we execute. Uh, so in the main, I would say that uh, our gamble on avoiding the investor route uh, and turning to depending on the reader for financial support has, has proved a correct one. I think the fact that we are regarded today in India as one of the most um, uh, editorially independent organizations springs in large measure from the fact that financially we don't depend on, on big advertisers or big investors. And this, is a, uh, this gives us a lot of uh, confidence to do the work that we do. But I would add that uh, there are limitations in this, uh, which is that uh, scaling up uh, at a fast enough speed becomes a challenge, right? So, so today we are, we are quite capable of coasting along at the current, current rate of operations. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a ch we have to innovate and think of new ideas when we consider how we're going to go to the next stage. Because uh, you can't, I mean, donations, the volume of donations grows only gradually. It's hard to think of it jumping from one level to the next. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Uh, yeah, we had a panel yesterday with um, another Indian editor from the News Minute, Danya Rajendran, who I know is a friend and colleague, and she was suggesting that that you know you've been so successful, I think, because they're also trying to build the reader revenues, um, that the Y has been so successful because you really cover politics, you know, in a in a very sort of you know quite a hard way, right? Yeah. Um, and it seems that in your case that success also brings more pressure, right? Yeah. And um, you faced police charges, and then last year you found yourself at the centre of your own stories of state surveillance in the Pegasus scandal, and more recently the trolling, organised trolling of journalists, among other political or you know actors. So tell us a little bit about sure. that. Sure. So, so so far I've spoken about the business, uh, the business side of what we do. Yeah. But there is the repression angle, which is also part of today's, today's panel. And I think all of us, in some measure, are dealing with the challenges that uh, media in, in, a, in a democracy or in any society ought not to face. In India, we have a, um, a media environment that, on paper, as far as the Constitution is concerned, is, is completely free. The Constitution guarantees um, freedom of speech and freedom of press. Um, and over the years, the courts have also uh, tended to interpret, um, you know, have, have tended to uh, come down on uh, government attempts to attack freedom of press. So, so there is a background of the last 60, 70 years of a of an operating environment that has, by and large, been free. Uh, of course, freedom is what you make of it. 
So in many ways, it's the owners of the media who have tended to undermine uh, media freedom by not making full use of of, uh, of what they can, uh, what they can do, and keeping off certain stories. But what's changed over the last seven years is that uh, a lot of the traditional tools of harassment of journalists uh, and media organizations, which have always existed even within this free media environment, and they exist in every democracy. They exist in Australia. They exist in the UK. Of course, in Hungary, anywhere else. For example, uh, what's known as a slap suit, a strategic lawsuit against public participation, right? When, when a powerful company or some kind of an official entity, uh, Singapore makes use of uh, defamation cases uh, to, to attack the media. Uh, so, you know, defamation has been part of the landscape in India uh, and has been used to harass and intimidate. What's, what we've seen over the last seven years is uh, a very concerted weaponization of defamation as a method of harassment. And also added onto that, uh, attempts to criminalize reporting, which has not happened in the past. So since the onset of the pandemic, we've tracked something like 70 or 80 cases where reporters who did stories that were critical of some aspect or the other of government functioning handling of the pandemic or the distribution of relief supplies or the shortage of PPE equipment or whatever. Uh, 70 or 80 cases of journalists against whom pretty serious police charges were filed uh, for breaking the uh, Epidemic Diseases Act or in some cases uh, inciting disaffection against the government. Uh, there have even been cases, believe it or not, of uh, sedition, which, which you know, is meant to involve <laughs> Uh, I mean, the crime of sedition invokes the idea that you're organizing some kind of armed insurrection against the state. But we've seen sedition charges being invoked against journalists uh, for making allegations of wrongdoing by the government. And uh, in Jammu Kashmir, uh, we have seen several journalists being prosecuted uh, or charged under pretty draconian laws like the Public Safety Act or the uh, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is India's anti-terror law. Sajad Gul and Fahad Shah, uh, two well-known journalists, have now spent the better part of four or five months, I think, uh, in prison in Kashmir under the anti-terror law. In Uttar Pradesh, Siddiq Kappan, who is a, a journalist who was going to report on the gang rape and murder of uh, a Dalit woman, uh, uh, he has spent the last year in jail uh, under the anti-terror law. So this is something which is new. Uh, the Wire and me myself have also experienced, uh, I think we have five criminal cases against us for, uh, for stories that the police have not liked. Uh, but, uh, in many, but we've escaped um, arrest or incarceration, which is not the case uh, as far as Siddiq and Fahad and um, um, Sajad Gula are concerned. And this remains a major matter of concern. The final point I'll make, uh, uh, because uh, Jackie mentioned Pegasus and trolling, so, we, so, uh, so the wire was part of uh, the Pegasus project last year, this global reporting uh, project run, led by Forbidden Stories in France, where uh, we looked into uh, this leaked data set of numbers. And we found that in India, uh, at least 40 or 45 journalists had their telephone numbers in this database. And when we did random sampling of the actual phones, uh, we found uh, maybe five or six journalist phones, including mine and uh, that of another colleague, MK Venu at The Wire, plus a few other senior reporters, uh, had been positively infected with, with Pegasus. Uh, apart from that, human rights defenders, uh, opposition politicians, uh, so on and so forth, uh, which suggests that uh, the government uh, is, the, is not content just with filing criminal cases, but also wants to maintain active surveillance on, on people like us who are reporting on, on, on what's going on. And trolling is another, uh, is another form of, uh, of harassment, um, particularly against women uh, journalists. We did a story, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which exposed the official and political nexus with 
uh, really an industrial scale level of trolling. But uh, it's very clear that uh, journalists and others who are critical of the government uh, are regularly and brutally trolled on social media because social media as a platform is a great leveler, right? It, 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 it's allowed uh, people to challenge the government with, uh, with a counter narrative. And uh, although the government is very effective in using social media itself, but uh, whenever somebody uh, is able to uh, assert themselves and they're critical, and particularly if they're women, uh, the, uh, the whole troll army can get pretty nasty. And this is also something which I think uh, has, has an effect of uh, intimidating and the idea is to push somebody off that space. And, and you guys have done a great story on that if you want to follow that up on the wire. Um, I just, Veronica, let's go back to Hungary because I, I think that we've all been watching the election campaign and the the outcome um, from last weekend, you know, and, and how the state captured media really flooded the space and drowned out the opposition. And I think, you know, we all talk about, um, you know, like that sort of state capture, you know, and, and understand it intellectually, but what is it like to actually live and work in that space? And, you know, and how do you see, like, how you can have impact there? <coughs> I think I used this one. Uh, yeah, the election regarding the election result. If uh, somebody haven't followed that, uh, again, uh, uh, the two thirds of the parliament seats in Hungary goes uh, to the populist Fidesz party led by Viktor Orban. Uh, that's what happened last Sunday, and of course the media capture. I think, in my opinion, is a really important factor. Uh, regarding this, these results, but not the only one. So, uh, of course, it's not always a single matter that why, uh, why a party uh, winning the elections and have won it three times continuously in the last 12 years. Uh, and how is it like, uh, and, and how can we make impact? That was the question. Well, uh, the hardest... Um, I mean, in Hungary, uh, journalists are not put to prison or not being killed like it happened in, in, in very different countries, even in the EU as well. But uh, at the same time, in the last uh, 10 years or so, it became uh, much and much harder to, to work as a critical independent journalist. I have worked as a journalist in the last two decades, and like in 15 years ago, uh, in Hungary, the freedom of press situation was quite similar, like now in Finland. I mean, if you check the lists of the reporters without borders uh, uh, indexing the freedom of press in every country in the world, in 2006, Hungary was the 10th out of 160 countries. So from this data, you can see that it can happen. I mean, <laughs> and now the Hungary is, is the 92nd on that list. Uh, and I lived that through. And, uh, and the most important experience uh, is uh, the lacking the access to information, basically. We, sometimes we are not invited to press conferences or we don't know about them. We just realize from the state news media agency that Mr. Orban talked by the Ukrainian-Hungarian border about the war, and we didn't even know about that. Uh, and, uh, and, and the most frustrating uh, experience is basically the job is that we ask questions. <laughs> so if we do not get answers, um, it's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, but at the same time, regarding the impact, I mentioned that Hungary's population is 10 million people and we have like six to 700,000 readers a day. So people who, who find important to, to consume fact-based news sources find us. But the problem is that media pluralism in Hungary basically only exists online. There is a large 
TV broadcaster, a German-owned TV broadcaster, RTL, which is independent uh, from any political forces, but, but the vast majority of the media companies are somehow uh, at, uh, attached, connected uh, to the politicians. So for my everyday experiences, access to information is the most mm. uh, problematic thing. And, 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 and to watch the big picture, the ownership structure of the media is the largest problem and that the advertisement market is, of course, it's fragile because of the COVID, because of the war in the neighboring country, etc. But at the same time, in my country, is strongly affected by politics as well. So one of the largest actors in the advertisement field is the Hungarian state itself. And of course, they don't like to spend the money on critical, independent uh, media outlets. Yeah, and and it, it's not just the the government advertising, though, is it? There, there's you're also cut out of other advertising yeah. income from other, you know, business and things like that. Is that the kind of pressure that you're under? Uh, well, uh, when we uh, launched Telex, we thought there won't be any advertisement revenue. And uh, we became surprised that we have, because I think Telex became quite big in a very short time. So large companies, mostly international, Western European or American companies, like car companies, IT companies, they just... They just want to reach people, and, and they can reach a lot of people through our, through our site. So we have a very great sales uh, group uh, at Telex, our own sales group, and they are very effective uh, uh, to, to in, in finding uh, advertisement. But the majority is coming from small, like 10 euro donations from yeah. 50,000 people. And, and so I guess that that means when you're so reliant on your audience and, I mean, how, like what, what's important in terms of keeping the audience on your side, if you like, and, you know, continuing like the, to provide the funding, but also, I guess, you know, to support the media, to support what you're doing. How do you kind of maintain that relationship with the audience? What's important there? Uh, I'm not sure that I understand the question right, that how, how do we make... Yeah, so, so trust, I think, is really important, right, in this, in this kind of environment, particularly when you're up against, you know, such a captured media. Um, so how do you keep the audience that supports you mm -hmm. supporting you? Yeah, I understand now, and I'd like to emphasize again that we are not against <laughs> the system, but we just we just believe in in journalism, and that's what we do. And I think that's what the audience um, think that it worth supporting because our audience, according to our internal researches, because we have very frequent uh, audience researches surveys and we have a very active connection to, to our audience because, uh, as I mentioned, we rely on them. Uh, they say that uh, it's really hard to get facts mm. uh, in the Hungarian public sphere. So basically, they finance their, um, their knowledge gathering uh, uh, necessity in their lives. So, so, um, so we just do the same job, basically, what we've done in the last two decades. And, uh, and now uh, they agree <laughs> with us that it's important. OK, great. Darina, back to, um, back, back to Ukraine. And Kiev Independent has had to pivot to war since you started. I know, um, you know, we, we had a conversation in early December when you were setting up and, and talked about, um, with you and, and Olga, the, the, the editor of Kiev Independent, about the importance of establishing the, this voice for, you know, the, the build-up at the time. And I, I just wonder, like, since then, you know, what you've been through, how you and the team have had to restructure and rethink about, you know, how have you rethought your journalism, 
you know, to meet the needs of the moment? And how is it working on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I'll probably start with uh, a bit of context. So <laughs> the main problem in, you know, Ukraine's media is that journalists are dying from Russian missiles and that every field assignment is a 50-50% of dying um, on the assignment. Um, the other problem is that the media market was generally not prepared for the war. We didn't have anything really. We didn't have bulletproof vests. We didn't have helmets. I mean, uh, I, I would say like a, probably one set for a newsroom and not every newsroom. We didn't have anything because we were a startup four months old. Um, the other thing is that none of Ukrainian journalists working in the field have war reporting insurance. And there is not even a way to get a war reporting insurance in Ukraine. There is no insurance companies that can provide this kind of service. Um, so, you know, unlike Western media who do parachute visits to Ukraine now to report on the events, uh, they have they come with the security companies accompanying them with like the whole the the full body armor. We don't have that, um, and we that's the conditions we are working in right now. Um, that said, we also, um, you know, coming back to the Kiev Independent, uh, Kiev Independent, as I said before, was a startup, and we uh, had to cut stuff and to cut salaries to make sure that we can uh, grow sustainably, that we don't, uh, you know, create a huge budget that we can sustain with the with the means we have. Um, <coughs> And uh, we basically have oh, just over 20 people on staff. Not all of them are editorial team, and then not all of them are full-time. Uh, on the first day of war, we had to switch to 24-7 news reporting. Uh, we have only three editors. Uh, every editor has a five-hour news wire shift every day, but also they have to edit a lot of stories and coordinate a lot of work. Um, we had to send people to work in the field to report from the um, field, and that in Ukraine's case means from combat. Um, we can't really send people to do that because as I said, we don't have any production, we don't have any insurance. We can just say like, hey, good luck to you. Um, you know, and that's obviously not good enough to assign stories like that. So we decided not to uh, assign field reporting uh, and only if the people would volunteer, we would do that. Um, luckily for us, five people in the newsroom volunteered to do the field reporting. Three of them were stayed in Kyiv and Kyiv suburbs from the very beginning of war. Uh, two of them joined a bit later. Um, and I'm very grateful to them because they just did this because they believed this is what had to be done. Um, and I think that's kind of real uh, heroism in, in, in our case because, you know, uh, they are all uh, well and I hope they still stay well, but if something happened to them, you know, their families would, wouldn't get nothing and, uh, you know, no one would get anything really. So um, everything we do is basically, yeah, <laughs> is, is an um, effort that... Uh, people just choose to do, uh, you know, because they feel like they have no other choice, because they feel like they have to fight this invasion. And they have to add one thing. So unlike um, in, other, in our country, uh, I, when I talk to a lot of people from the neighboring countries, they say like, uh, you know, for example, from people from Belarus or, you know, Russia before the war, because now I don't really talk to Russians, um, they would say like, but, you know, we lived in this uh, authoritarian state for 20 years and you lived in a free country, but we weren't granted a free country. We fought for this free country to the nail and we built all the democratic institutions in Ukraine. The civil society did. And journalists in Ukraine, you know, worked for 20, for 30 years to build the civil society and they succeeded. While Russian journalists apparently failed because their civil society is non-existent. And, you know, by the end of 2021, we in Ukraine adopted so many progressive laws that, you know, like animal production law or, you know, gender equality law. And this happened thanks to the civil society and, and Ukrainian media. 
and we were perfectly able to handle our authorities. You know, uh, we weren't on the top of a media freedom list, of course, but, but we were getting there and we fought for it and our civil society would protest pressure against journalists as well as any anything else they would protest. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't probably let us in a press conference sometimes, but when we pressured them to do so, they would. Because in Ukraine, we actually managed to get to the point when the, uh, you know, when the authorities are the servants of the people. And we made sure they stay this way. And what's happening to us now, and this is so unfair because of this, because in our country, we managed to make sure that you know, we have the rights to do our work freely and that the people of Ukraine have the, the access to information. When I started working at, at, in media in Ukraine 12 years ago, there were precisely four independent media, two of them BBC and Radio Liberty. And then now we have multiple independent media. And even if you don't want to read independent media, you can't really go around it because there are so many independent projects in the regions and on the central level. They are of different quality, they struggle with different things and as sustainability and stuff, but they are there working for their people. And that's why this war is, you know, <laughs> the, the most unfair thing that can happen to a country. It has no economic or political reasons to happen, but it's there. And our journalists, my colleagues, are being killed by, um, by Russian soldiers, being targeted by Russian soldiers. A lot of people are kidnapped. Uh, apparently they have some kind of list of Ukrainian journalists and activists and they go to their houses and, you know, pressure their families or kidnap their families, kill their families to get to the journalists. So that's the reality we're in. And I just want to talk about how do you, how do you, how are you thinking about the future? Because you, there's a lot of focus now on um, Ukraine media and, and support and I know you know, that you were very sort of well set up to to build on that as soon as the war started. And, you you know, it's been reasonably successful in the crowdfunding campaign and also your your membership, um, you know, the membership income and, and growth. But how, how are you thinking about sustaining that? I mean, are you concerned that, you know, the, the focus will, you know, will dissipate and, you know, yeah, what's, what's the future? What's, what's, what's your message, I guess, to donors? But also, how are you thinking from a business point of view? How do you sustain this? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, basically, we... Uh, so, when, when the war started, we had everything set up. We had a membership, an active patron page set up. We already had an, a GoFundMe campaign set up. And by that moment, we already fundraised around $20,000. Um, and uh, we had some donor support already, so we didn't have to fundraise from the ground zero. Uh, and when the war started, you know, we were, frankly, you know, fundraising wasn't our biggest concern, really. So um, the fact that we had all of this set up really helped because people just started donating. They started looking for our pages on, on Patreon, GoFundMe, and they started donating. And in a month of war, we um, you know, crowdfunded over one and a half million British pounds um, on GoFundMe. And I think we we have around 7,000 members on Patreon with you know a monthly donations around $70,000. Uh, it's, you know, it's a rough number because they will also pay a lot of taxes uh, from that and, uh, you know, um, patron fees. But still, um, we already have some donor support. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but we also very clearly understand that we won't get one and a half million dollars every month uh, because the war fatigue is coming for us inevitably. And this is sad, but this is true. Uh, I think a lot of people in Europe <laughs> already get tired uh, from these horrible pictures we, we, we basically publish from Ukraine. They just don't want to know that. Uh, frankly, even, even at this conference, when I talk to people and I'm like, I'm from Ukraine, hey, and everybody's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and they just resort to their Aperol or, you know, a glass of wine because that's, you know, that's something that naturally happens to a person. You want to protect yourself from these horrors, especially when you can, right? You have this, uh, 
you, you have this freedom to live your lives and we don't, but that's kind of our problem, right? And uh, our mission at the Cave Independent is to basically make sure that we deliver as much as information as possible. Um, my, my idea is in terms of revenues, but also um, in terms of how we can uh, give this information in new forms, uh, is to basically, uh, in terms of revenue, I don't want to spend one and a half million on uh, salaries, travels, and operations. I obviously want to invest, maybe set up a fund like an endowment or something that would create revenues for us in the future. Uh, that would ensure the, you know, keep independent becoming a legacy media at some point. Um, and that would give us some space to basically make sure that we survive without commercial revenues for the years to come because commercial market won't come back just like that to Ukraine. It will have, it will take probably years to, for the advertisers to start allocating budgets for, you know, advertising in the media. Um, and we also understand that the membership will probably drop slowly. Uh, I, I already see a pretty big turn because people are like, you know, I became your member, but you're not very active providing benefits to the members. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, a lot of people are very understanding, but, uh, you know, there is also that, right? Um, and um, um, so I hope to invest I also hope to invest in in developing the company, like setting up. So uh, from the beginning of the war, we also went on a couple of additional platforms. We were on Facebook and um, Twitter, uh, and we had a website, but also we went on uh, Instagram and Telegram. Uh, we want to go on, on more platforms. We want to go on YouTube, on TikTok. So we basically want to be on all the possible platforms we can to deliver the important information. Um, but also, um, I want to invest in podcasts, uh, in video production. We have a lot of ideas, um, you know, around uh, partnerships. For example, we want to have an e-shop and promote Ukrainian artists. Uh, at the same time, and, and you know, Ukrainian producers of uh, essential cultural products. Um, that is something we are discussing right now. I think that's th these are the plans for now. And for now, I, I do need support to uh, basically cover the operations to have a runway to set up um, an endowment for the future, right? But uh, for now, we do not operational support. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty okay. much it. Uh, we've got just under we've got just under ten minutes left, and so I thought we could wrap up. Um, if each of you briefly could just talk about maybe either like what you see as a major challenge, or really, I guess, what are you optimistic about in you know where you are? What what gives you optimism? <laughs> Start with Veronica. I'm an optimistic person by personality, so um, I usually try to find uh, uh, the aspects that is promising. Uh, I'm optimistic because I believe in this team that we have and that we can make uh, our project Telex sustainable. Uh, I totally agree with you that we need to be, we need to, we need to raise a lot of legs. For instance, we started a web shop selling uh, merchandise, and it's surprisingly successful. We we uh, we launched a new project in Trans Transylvania called Trans Telex. Uh, there is the largest Hungarian uh, minority, uh, ethnic minority living in Romania. Uh, and uh, and the media sphere there uh, as problematic. Uh, I mean, the Hungarian language media sphere in in Transylvania as problem as problematic as as in Hungary. And there was a group of journalists who decided to quit their previous workplace. And the two stories were so similar. When, so when they contacted us and asked for our help. We, we told that, okay, we, we give the knowledge and they started a crowdfunding there as well. So now uh, there is one more independent critical media that can operate. So um, as I mentioned before, it is frustrating, but at the same time, uh, it, 
is so, uh, I so passionately believe that it's it's uh, needed to be done. Mm. Uh, that that is my drive. Great. Sit out. Yeah. Uh, I think first first of all the constraints or challenges. Uh, you know generating the kind of revenue that you need to grow. I mentioned this earlier that this is this is a constraint that we face. And uh, so we have some ideas, uh, largely revolving around um, unaddressed, or re revolving around the wire being able to fill gaps that the rest of the media themselves have created. For example, if the wire's initial success uh, as a, as a written platform, as a text-driven news, was because newspapers had abdicated to a certain extent. Uh, the, the kind of abdication on television, on the television news front is even more abject. And uh, you know, the state of, I would urge those of you who've never seen uh, Indian news television to just go on YouTube and watch some of the big channels like Times Now or Republic TV and you'll be horrified. Uh, at uh, at what transpires for 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 prime time news and prime time news discussion, it's awful, and uh, uh, I feel that there is a gap that uh, we could address. So for us, video is a very important part of what we do, and uh, we are also thinking India is one of those odd democracies where there is no uh, non-government news radio. Uh, so uh, by regulation, so that you can't get licenses for a a news radio station, but the internet is unregulated. So uh, dig digital radio, internet radio is something that we're looking at. So there are various new things that we can do which give us, uh, give us hope. And like Veronica, you know, the fact is that journalists can't afford, in our situation, uh, pessimism isn't a word that, uh, you know, we can allow us to, you know, that, that can bog us down. The fact is that we exist because, uh, and the work that we do is important precisely because uh, our societies are undergoing great stress and uh, you know there's an integral connection between the you know state of democracy and the state of media if you don't have vibrant media uh, then it's not just freedom of press that gets affected or you know the rights of individual journalists but uh, democracy as a whole and frankly the price is too big for us to to pay, so we'll have to, you have to keep uh, battling the challenges that we confront. And what's gratifying is that when we do when we do big stories, the tech fog investigation or the Pegasus investigation, or when we've looked at the business practices of some of India's biggest corporate houses or politicians, the public response, the reader response, has been enormous. Uh, and there's nothing more gratifying than than doing a story today, and four days later, you get on a WhatsApp from a stranger. Uh, a version of your story in one of India's regional languages uh, that's been just simplified and somebody's made a meme out of it. Or I can't tell you the thrill that, they, that, that I get. And I say, well, this is what makes it worth it. That if the, if the stuff we do circulates and people read and share, then uh, it's, it's all worth it. Darina? Um, I'm not an optimist <laughs> as a personality. Uh, and I frankly find it hard to find a, ro a lot of reasons for optimism. Um, I, I'm very grateful for the support. Uh, we're getting the financial support, the information support, and I just want to say that the information support probably will start going down, and just I just want to ask you, my colleagues in different countries, to keep up this sport to keep talking about the war in Ukraine. Um, we at the Kiev Independent would, you know, never decline a request for an interview or, you know, um, an email. We could just miss it, but not decline. So if you want to talk to us, uh, you can message me anywhere, and we would try to help you do your reporting on what's happening in Ukraine. Um, on the other side, I, I do have hopes. Uh, I do hope that, you know, after this war, uh, we at the Kiev Independent will keep doing our job and will keep reporting on Ukraine that is flourishing and, and uh, growing. But also I realize that uh, 
we are deeply fucked up. Uh, and like, I can't even start describing. Um, you know, we have hundreds of women and children raped and they will have to recover in the years to come. We have hundreds of thousands of weapons given to people to join the territorial defense because our army wasn't the size of the Russian army and we had to do something. And we, all of these people will have PTSD after the war. And every one person in Ukraine will have PTSD and will have to live through that trauma while trying to rebuild the country that is largely destroyed by Russian army. And it will probably set us back, I don't know, 10 years. But also I know that we'll try to, you know, do our best to rebuild. And, and I just hope that while we do that, while we try to live through the trauma, while also rebuilding the country and joining the European community, that you guys in the, in the European press will be able to support us information-wise and will be able to talk about it and will not get tired of it. And that's the hope I have. And that's the, you know, something I want to ask of you, because um, frankly, optimism is not something that is easily obtained now in Ukraine, especially if you're a journalist and your job is to basically live through the news, every news item out there. And there are a lot of horrors. So, you know, I'll, I promise if, if we get through this next year, I'll, I'm here, I'll be more optimistic, but you know, not today. <laughs> Okay, so we, we're out of time, and um, I really want to thank Siddharth, Darina, and Veronica, who I think, you know, give us all some inspiration and, and hope that, as journalists, that we can actually reclaim that, that kind of democratic space for journalism, you know, particularly when it's under pressure and our communities need it most, and they're... The models that they have built, I think, show that it can be done. And that's an important lesson for, for all of us, the whole journalism you know, world community. Uh, so with the IPI Global Network, um, if you want to know more, you can reach out to me. I'm here. Uh, my colleague, Jamie, is sitting here in the second row, is here as well at the festival. Um, you know, any of the colleagues here. Uh, or look on the website, there's more information about each of these media organisations or, of course, go, you know, check them out directly. Our website is ipi.media. Okay, thanks very much for coming.